Hi, everybody. Andrew Champagne here alongside J.D. Fox. You're just going to have to trust me on that, given the lighting that he's got going. For this week's edition of Champagne and J.D., astute viewers will know this is not J.D.'s home setup. He is on the road right now, so very grateful that we've been able to audible into a time that works for us to give you a quality edition of Champagne and J.D. on Breeders' Cup Weekend. J.D., Oh, we almost had you. We almost had it for just a second. That's going to be a recurring theme, and I'm going to come up with some witty one-liners just off the top of my little head. But, J.D., how you doing, buddy? I'm doing well. Um, obviously not the setup we normally have with my lighting and my cameras and all of that good stuff. So we're just dealing with the elements, and you'll see that I will change various colors, and I, I don't know. We're trying here, folks. But, yeah, on the road uh, in Southern California for the Breeders' Cup. And, you know, we wanted to give you some information and maybe kind of fire it at a, at a fast and frenetic pace here um, and talk about some of our key horses for the weekend. And I think it, it's a we want to be as informative as possible and we don't want to be long-winded. And I just made a very long-winded explanation of doing that, Andrew. So you might have to take over from here. Well, I think people's jaws are on the floor because they see me, they see you and go, wait, they're not going to be long winded. What the hell is this? But we are going to do things a little bit differently here to try to give you something that maybe is a little bit different from some of the other podcasts and the other shows that you might be watching ahead of the Breeders' Cup. We're going to be doing some stuff focusing on our most likely winners our live long shots, and bold predictions for each day of the Breeders' Cup World Championships down where the turf meets the surf at Old Del Mar. Take a plane, take a train, take a car. Try to get that song out of your head. Spoiler alert, hot take coming. It's not a very good song. It gets very, very old. And I know there are people in San Diego that will take their pitchforks and their torches and just come at me up in Concord for that. But you know what? You do that, you're going to miss the first couple of races on Friday and Friday's card, J.D., really, really good. I love Friday's card. Not just the Breeders' Cup races, the undercard races as well. A lot of potential ways to make some money. And it's one of those cards where you only need to be right once or twice in order to come out ahead a pretty nice chunk of change. Yeah, it's a great card up and down. And, you know, we've got, you know, excited for a friend of the show, Jonathan Wong. He's got a runner early on in race two in the Qatar Golden Mile. Uh, so uh, good luck to Boise, uh, the Jonathan Wong horse in that one. Just a good card up and down. And obviously the Breeders' Cup races begin in race number six. But when we're talking about our most likely winners, I want to focus on race nine, Andrew. And I know um, you're going to have an opinion on this race a little later on in the proceedings here. Uh, but in the juvenile, I, I look at the post draw here, and I think it was absolutely critical in a race that seems to have a lot of speed signed on. And I think the fastest horse drew the inside post position. So for me, my most likely winner on Friday is going to be Jack Christopher. Uh, obviously, nine to five morning line. I would be shocked even in that deep of field if we get that nine to five. Uh, but uh, Chad Brown has pushed all the right buttons on this horse uh, and the third race up for uh, this very talented Munnings Colt uh, seems to be perfectly drawn for what tactically Jose Ortiz is going to want to do, which is send. And I think despite everybody thinking there's a lot of speed signed on, just looking from a pure numbers perspective, Jack Christopher is the fastest of those horses. But I know Andrew will say this and I don't want to spoil it too much, but I know Andrew does not like to take a horse at that heavy odds doing something for the first time, and that's going two turns in this spot. But I think the breeding is just fine for two turns here. Um, and I, I, I think this horse is just the class of this field. So I'm happy to take short odds on Jack Christopher, and we'll be singling in uh, some uh, multi-race exotics um, as we close out Friday. Andrew, your most likely winner on Friday. So you went to race nine. I'm going to turn that upside down. We're going to go back in time to race number six. This is the juvenile turf sprint. It is the very first Breeders' Cup race. So not waiting. We're diving right in. And you look at this race. My goodness, is there a lot, and I mean a lot, of early speed signed on. 
There are some fast horses in this race. Averly Jane will likely go off favored. One timer from the barn of Larry Ravelli has a lot of speed. Time to party has a lot of speed. A couple of other horses have a lot of speed. They're going to go very, very fast early on. And as a result, I want a closer. I have found one in the form of armor who is six to one on the morning line and who had a very unlucky trip last time out in the middle park stakes at Newmarket. There are a lot of European replays that are out there. Some are easier to find than others. If you watch this race, you will see a closer that had nowhere to go for a very, very long time in that particular race. He finally gets a seam, bursts through it, and winds up beaten less than a length by a horse named Perfect Power. If Perfect Power showed up in this race, he would probably be the two-to-one favorite. Perfect Power is a darn good horse that has won a couple of Group 1 races overseas. Armor gets Ryan Moore. He gets a lively pace set up. And I think we're going to get a price on him. He's 6-1 to one in the morning line. I think anything north of 9-2 to two represents very good value. Faster they go early, the better his chances figure to be. Give me Armor as a single in that late pick five to pick him up and lay him down like a house of cards. And I ordered them in this manner because with my long shot play of Friday, I am also going to be in race six. You see, there was some synergy there that we started in race nine and we went back to race six because I want to keep talking about race six. And I want to talk about the two coffee maker. Now coffee maker on debut in April at Keeneland one by six and a quarter uh, going four and a half furlongs on the dirt. And you know what the connections and Wesley Ward decided? Hey, let's try this horse against the boys in the Coventry at Aska. And what happened there in the six furlong race is this horse was in the lead at about the four and a half furlong mark before fading. Eight beaten four, but it's a much better effort than it looks on paper. Came back to the States. I don't think the horse really liked the surface at Kentucky Downs with the rock hard backside to that surface, the rock hard bottom of it. And no real excuses at Keeneland. Averly Jane was the better horse that day. Probably broke a little sl slow for Irad Ortiz. Gets Jose Ortiz up for Wesley Ward. 12-1 to 1 on the morning line. I think Coffee Maker could upset here taking this field wire to wire. It's a good betting race for sure. Wesley Ward knows how to win this race. You're going to get a little bit of a price. I understand that. The more I look at armor, the more I like that horse. But if you're looking for a price, at least underneath, Coffee Maker probably better than some of those recent races would indicate. Now, as far as my live long shot is concerned, I'm going to make JD relive one of his least favorite days. We're going to go to race number eight. This is the Breeders' Cup Juvenile Phillies Turf. On Friday, September 3rd, 2021, Andrew Champagne went 8 for 10 at Saratoga Racecourse, and one of those winners was Bubble Rock, horse number five in the program, who won a maiden special weight race like a very, very good horse. They hit the half mile in 46 flat, which is like walking, going five and a half furlongs at Saratoga, and they came home in 102 and four for five and a half furlongs. This horse flew. Came back and won the Matron. It was a little bit more workmanlike, but I think that may well have been a bounce. I think Bubble Rock ran so big two starts back, maybe needed the bounce, still won, and now has every chance to bounce back in career start number four. There's a lot of pedigree to suggest that two turns is not going to be a problem. The damn reef point is a half to a horse named Blue Chipper, who ran third in the Grade 1 Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile a couple of years ago, is a Group 1 winner over in Korea. The mile's not going to be a problem for Bubble Rock here. I think Bubble Rock is going to be on or near the lead in a race that doesn't have a whole heck of a lot of early speed signed on. The recent workouts sure look good. Erod Ortiz likely had a choice of several runners in here. Winds up on this one. Eight to one on the morning line. I can't see Bubble Rock coming down from that price. I think Bubble Rock is an overlay at that price. And if Bubble Rock wins, it's going to be a very good day for me, regardless of anything else that happens. Andrew will rock, rock the Bubble Rock, and he won't stop. We're going to go back to race number nine because my bold prediction for Friday is that Corniche will not hit the board. Again, I think that Jack Christopher is the speed of the speed and is drawn in the one path. 
in the one hole. Cornish coming from the outside for the 12. Mike Smith is going to have to send. I don't see any other way to do it. And from that outside, it seems like a perfect send and fade type setup. Uh, you know, despite, I mean, it was a strong effort in the American Pharaoh last time out, but this is a different breed of speed with Jack Christopher in my eyes. So Cornish not uh, making, not hitting the board is my bold prediction for Friday. And I think we're going to stick in that race, Andrew. We are. My bold prediction is the horse JD loves does not want any part of two turns. I know the grade one champagne came back very fast on figures. Your namesake race. Yes, exactly. If you watch that race at the top of the stretch, Jack Christopher looks like easygoer and like he's going to pull away by about 20. And you can hear it in John Embriel's call. He is calling the race as though, as a sideshow apparently goes on behind me in the parking garage, if the Ghost right police the whip. department happens to be watching this, I'm just going to say, this happens several times a week in the parking garage behind my apartment building, just in case anybody wants to check that out. Anyway, Jack Christopher's supposed to win that race by a city block. And with about an eighth of a mile to go, alarm bells start going off. He wins. But he looks pretty darn leg weary. They did go fast early. It's entirely possible that that's why. But I see that. I see his likely price. And I think he gets beat. I think there's a fair amount of early speed signed on in here. And maybe Jack Christopher is the speed of the speed. But Cornish is going to go early. Pinehurst is probably going to go early. Barossa may well be Bob Baffert's fullback in this particular instance. Wouldn't be surprised if there's funny business going on there. And there's a couple other horses that can go early as well. I think Todd Pletcher is sitting with a very good hand here with command performance, the horse that ran second in the champagne, and with double thunder who has never run a bad race and is bred to go all day and gets Flavian Pratt in the saddle. I think Todd Pletcher is the barn to watch in here. I like Jack Christopher going one turn up to about a mile, two turns, given what I saw in the champagne at that likely price, I'll try to beat him. Well, one of us will be right and one of us will be wrong. And there are ways in any... which we could both be wrong. I'm just saying. Well, I, I guess. I, I guess that that is true. But I try I try to think with a more positive attitude, Andrew. How's that going for you? We can take it some days. We can leave it others. I was going to but... say, go back to the opera and be a phantom over there. So Friday, the future stars will shine. Saturday is when things get serious as we talk older horses. And um, we'll let you lead off here for Saturday's card. You're most likely winner on Saturday. I'm not going to lie. Part of me picked this race so I could say the sponsor. Race number six is the Big Ass Fans Breeders' Cup Dirt Mile, the sponsor that is so revolutionary and so edgy, you will not hear it on television but you'll hear it here on Champagne and JD. If you like what we do, go on down below, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, really helps us out. And I say that because I've been dodging saying these words. I don't think anyone beats life as good in this particular race. And I have been looking all over for an alternative because I was not impressed by the Kelso. I don't think he beat anything. He made the lead. He walked Nobody went and got him. Then I look at this race. He's going to make the lead again. And I don't think anybody's going to come and get him. I think Silver State was better earlier in the year. You look at a horse like Ginobili or as an announcer once called him Gino Billy. The last two races have been huge, but it's such a gigantic leap up. And then he goes to the sidelines. I don't know what to make of that horse. If life is good runs the race, life is good can run. I think the race is for second. And if you're playing some of these multi-race exotics and you need a single, I think life is good as a free square. Well, I, I am uh, going with a free square that I think uh, you'll also hear if you're not hearing that life is good as a free square. And I'm going to the Breeders' Cup Distaff because I think Latruska is a free square in that one. My most likely winner uh, is the charge for Fausto Gutierrez. Um, just this horse has done nothing wrong really since back in March. And um, 
obviously has been just running rough shot over this division. Um, you know, she's uh, beaten everybody. Um, there's no real new challengers here um, that we haven't seen before. I guess you, Malatat would be the, the one exception there, but um, I generally don't like to pick the, the Phillies against older in this race at the end of a tough season. Um, I, I want a horse with some experience and some uh, known stamina. And I think Latruska is the horse there. So again, eight to five morning line. I, I, I would sign up for that today and bet just large sums of money if I could. Uh, I don't think we're getting eight to five on Saturday. Latruska sits just off the pace and takes them home from the top of the stretch on. You think Latruska is going to rate? That's interesting because you look at well, this. Well, the reason, the reason why I think Latruska is going to rate is because I think Bill Mott on the outside of Latruska with horologist just has one setting, and that's grab it this field and try to set it up for some It's revving the engines like the cars behind me, yeah. So I do think Latruska might rate here, and I think horologist is going to go as fast as need be up front. This is a mile and eighth race that could honestly have a 22 flat, 22 and one first quarter because horologist is going to go – just that fast now mott doesn't have another horse in this field so you can't say it's opening it up for anybody but somebody has to go out for any other horse in this field to have a chance against latruska and i do think latruska doesn't necessarily need the lead i know i'm probably alone in that sentiment but i, I look at the apple blossom contested lead was in second then closed in for the win and some of the races earlier on in the career in if you go back in Mexico, this horse was raiding a lot of the time. It wasn't just coast to coast finishes. So I think we ultimately see Latruska in the lead because Latruska is the best physical specimen in those races. I don't necessarily think she needs the lead. And, you know, she's 17 wins and 22 starts, making her 23rd start on Saturday. I think she's a little more versatile than we give her credit for. My thinking on that particular race is maybe Latruska is just better than these horses. If every horse goes that might go, doesn't Royal Flag look like an overlay at eight to one? I will have a play on Royal Flag at or near that price. I think that's a very nice horse for the Chad Brown barn. And I like the win in the Bell Dame where she was up a little bit closer than maybe she had been in the past. Royal Flag, in fact, was very nearly my long shot play for the day. But rather than go with Royal Flag at eight to one, I'm going to go with a far bigger price in race number 11, the Breeders' Cup turf. This field is led by an old friend of mine. Tarnawa was very, very good for me last year. I was horrible. The first one and three quarter days of the Breeders' Cup last year, Tarnawa and Authentic wound up stopping the bleeding and at least getting my bankroll back to about even, which was nice. Tarnawa might well still be good enough, but I have very few hard and fast handicapping rules that I never stray by. One of them is this. And you can sing along to the tune of You Don't Mess Around with Jim by Jim Croce for some of this. You don't tug on Superman's cape. You don't spit into the wind. You don't pull the mask off the old Lone Ranger. And you never, ever, 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 ever bet against Frankie Dottori in the Breeders' Cup turf. He has the mount on broom for trainer Aiden O'Brien. And here's a fun little exercise for you. Take your pen... Take your past performances if you've printed them out. Don't put your pen on your computer screen or on your iPad. I don't want to be liable for that. But if you have printed past performances, take your pen, cross out the Arc de Triomphe. And doesn't Broom's form look considerably better if you can just forgive the one bad race over very heavy going that he probably hated? If you look at the time form ratings for this horse, you see a lot in the low 120s. You see a couple of 121s, a 122, a couple of 123s. Those are the same numbers Tarnawa's been running. Do you want Tarnawa at 2 to 1, 5 to 2? Or do you want Broom at 20 to 1 for Frankie Dottori and trainer Aiden O'Brien, who has won this race six times? Give me Broom at anywhere close to that price. And that's another horse that regardless of if anything else happens over the course of the weekend, if Broom wins, it's a good weekend for me. And give me Bolshoi Ballet at any price. I just will take any price. 
Any price? Uh, I mean, I, I just want to see Bolshoi Ballet draw in. And I'll give you three to five. Price. No thanks. You, you said any price. Well, I did, and and I'm kind of I was kind of lying. I was being a little facetious here. There um, you go. We're we're gonna back all the way up for the long shot play to a race we've already talked about here, and that's the Dirt Mile, where life is good. You're most likely winner of Saturday rides. I really think Ping Zhang can pick up the pieces and have a big shot in this race. If you're if you're asking me, you know, bet all the mo- all the money you have in the world for this horse to win, I would not. But I think this is a horse that you definitely have to be cagey with and use in the first and second spots in your mul- in your uh, uh, exotics and. I think the form has been really, really good. The last two wins uh, were great. The layoff was a needed one, has come back at Keeneland and just worked a fury of works that have been good in the short uh, you know, time frame that we have here in terms of getting out on the track and doing it. And then, you know, the formal work, the one formal work, 47 and one. That's a bullet my friend. And that's a great uh, start for Ping Zhang. Again, not somebody that we would expect to lead in this field has been a leader at most points in the career, but has also come from the back of the field. And I think Kawada has got a lot of options in this race uh, to go to sit or to sit back. And I, I think probably one of the more versatile horses in this race, obviously was entered in the sprint last year, didn't draw in, uh, gets into the mile this year, and I actually think, despite being a seven furlong specialist in Japan, I think the mile might suit him because they don't run a lot of dirt miles in in uh, Japan. To be honest, you usually get past a mile. You go seven furlongs, or you go a mile and eighth, mile and a sixteenth. You don't see a lot of straight miles. The other thing I will say is you're like, okay, Japanese horse in a dirt race. Well, if you're outside of North America and you're looking at dirt form, Japan is the next best place to get it and find it. And I think Ping Zhang has a shot 12 to one on the morning line. At some point, a Japanese horse is going to come over and win a Breeders' Cup race. It may well be this year with Loves Only You and the Philly and Mare Turf, which is a wide open race. And that one absolutely has a shot. For the most part, though, at least as far as dirt goes, I'm fading them until they prove me wrong. Maybe it's this year. There are a couple of horses that are very, very intriguing. There's a Japanese raced son of Arrogate in the juvenile that some people think has a really big shot. We'll see. Uh, At some point, that breeding program, which breeds for stamina as opposed to whatever the hell brilliance is, is going to catch up in big races. Will it be this year? I don't know. Will it be in the next five to ten years? I wouldn't bet against it, but as far as that race goes, I just don't think life is good is vulnerable in that particular position. However, if you're looking for a favorite that I think is vulnerable, listen up. In the Breeders' Cup race, nobody wants to talk about the Philly and Mare Sprint, which is down to a field of five horses. I think Amin loses, and here's why. Edgeway needs the lead. Bella Sophia needs to go. Gamine needs to go. Mm -hmm. We're going to go very, very fast in that opening quarter mile. You look at the last race Gamine ran at Saratoga. When the opening quarter was posted in 23 and one, you could sticky Gamine's number in that first spot. There's no way anybody was going to catch that horse. She's going to have to go a lot faster in order to win this race. And that's not saying she can't, but she's going to be three to five in this race. And I think that's an underlay. By contrary, though, I think Cece gets the setup that she wants, that she didn't get two starts back in the ballerina when Gamine was jogging on an easy lead and Cece was patiently waiting for someone, anyone, to go with that horse. She's going to get that trip in this particular spot. And when she gets that kind of trip with a legitimate pace in front of her, she is very, very, very good. Now, I liked her a lot more at the four to one morning line price. We're not going to get that given the five horse field. My guess is she'll be about five to two. It's not sexy. I understand that, but I will be playing some early multi-race exotics, the pick five and the early pick four, that single CC on the end. 
Because if you can beat Gamine in those particular races, the payoff potential goes up significantly. That's my bold prediction. Maybe Gamine wins by 20 and proves me wrong. But just looking at the race shape, looking at the figure she's been running, she's no cinch. And I think Cece is going to give her all she can handle, given that she does get the race shape she wants. All right. My bold prediction. I've been waiting for this one. May have been just to pop Andrew. Maybe. But we're going to head to race eight. The sprint. I am going to just in classic. I'm stealing a little bit of Dave Weaver here. I can't necessarily tell you who's going to win the race. I don't know if Jackie War- Jackie's Warriors is sent here. I think Dr. Chevelle, very strong horse, could be the one. But I think there's one thing I can guarantee for you, and that is Lexitonian finishes second. Okay. So just all for that. Ahead, all your exotics, just slot Lexitonian key only in the second spot because that's what's going to happen. I just think Lexitonian has ran some huge races out of nowhere and even gotten some wins like the Vanderbilt out of nowhere at 34 to one. Um, You know, this has been a horse that does not get any respect. It's still not getting any respect. 21 on the morning line, obviously the forego, you can forego watching a replay of that race or looking at the past performances. Just don't with this horse. And okay. uh, The Met mile, just go ahead and throw that one out as well. But if you look at the other races this year, they're all great. There you go. Andrew, your horse. And I'm going to add a bonus one. This is going to be with it with a asterisk because Andrew, what is a show of champagne and JD without me loving a horse that does not win? It's it, it, yeah, it, it's an anomaly. That's for sure. Give me a horse that can't win. This is, this is a multi offender on this podcast. All right. We're headed to the gold race three absconded eight to one. Back up the Brinks truck, throw it all on this horse who has not won since, drum roll please, winning the Natalma at Woodbine, September 15th, 2019. I really like Zofel in that race. I'm sorry. I love Zofel there. I think you cross out the Belmont races. This horse comes back to two turns. I needed Zofel badly in that race three back where she got nosed by Got Stormy. God, that's painful. And I've been reliving that on podcasts all week long. Zofel is a big play for me in that race. I think she gets the pace that she needs. I think she's ready. Brendan Walsh does really good work with horses coming in off of a long layoff, but it's not like abscond is without merit in here. She wasn't far back behind princess grace a couple starts ago and princess grace is probably going to go favored. So there is a little bit of value there. A rat Ortiz junior signs on for Eddie Keneally. It's not the worst hanger you've ever picked. How's that sound? I'll take it. All right, that's good. You know, we're I'm all glad about- you didn't abscond from a positive comment there. Hey, you know, we're all in a very positive mood over here. I mean, this is the light side. Over there is the dark side. It's like an angel and a devil kind of thing here. All JD needs is a couple of horns on each side of his head. And I guess I guess the AirPods kind of count. I suppose. Yeah, you gotta get you some red ones. Maybe that's a Christmas present for you. But you said what would a show with champagne and JD be without a horse that hasn't won in a while? Well. What would a show of Champagne and JD be without final thoughts? So this, of course, the segment where we try to give you some final words of wisdom before we uh, bid you adieu. Uh, JD, you got anything? Yes, but I wanted to go last. So I was hoping you were just going to seamlessly transition into yours. Okay, I'll go. Be nice on social media. It's okay to have differing opinions, but... If we're starting pylons just for the sake of pylons, that's not cool. And that's all I'll say about that. All right, Andrew, still continuing the how many weeks has it been in a row with a social media based? Uh, well, I'm just giving you a bet. No, it's OK. No, that's one of those things that just needs to be said that nobody's going to listen to. And that at least one person who I have blocked will somehow get a clip of and call me soft. By the way, no time for you, buddy. So I wanted to end on a positive note. There you go. That's the spirit. My my friends in Arizona, you can bet on Friday and Saturday's card. Even, hey, get this. You can bet on the advance of Saturday on Friday in the state of Arizona. This is amazing news that, of course, did not 
happen until about 11.30 a.m. Welcome to Wednesday. 2007, the state of Arizona. <laughs> no long term. I mean, this is going to be it. You, you're not you're not getting uh, Del Mar on Thursday. You're not getting, you know, you're not getting Del Mar next year at this stage. You're just getting these two days. So enjoy it, Arizona. You're not going to have to drive to uh, my favorite uh, OTB that I have made the uh, excursion to in a city that Andrew does not like and I will not name on this podcast. Uh, but I will tell you that in the state of Arizona at your OTBs, at your ADW of choice or at your racetrack of choice, you will be able to bet on the Breeders' Cup. And we can get into the politics. I don't want to. I just want to be happy well, not. for the this state of Arizona. So happy, happy, joy, joy. Indeed. Happy, happy, joy, joy. Yes. And on a similar note, I realize that's a Ren and Stimpy thing, but season two of the Animaniacs. Looking forward to watching that. Just throwing that out there. Get well soon, Dan Housen. Indeed, Danhausen broke his leg Hausen. We are fan Hausens of Dan Hausens and have bought several shirts in an attempt to support his recovery. Dan Hausen, of course, has an open invitation to coming on this show. And this will be one of the clips that I cut on social media. So just in case Dan Hausen or one of the hired help that he has somehow sees this, you've got time. Just throwing it out there. Do we want to be pro Davis to get this going? I don't know. I don't know. That's that's I, I on don't you. Know. I feel like that could work for or against us. Yeah. So I we'll think see. we're going to send it home. Uh, Breeders Cup is going to be a lot of fun. I will be down at Old Del Mar. Uh, Andrew will be uh, up in the Golden Gate Fields vicinity. Um, I think that's as close as we're allowed to be from each other. So unfortunately, it was my short straw to be at Del Mar, but. <laughs> How dare you? How dare you just get the short straw to go down to San Diego and, and have fun at a racetrack? Say hi to the people that we like. Uh, yeah, I'm going to have a tough time getting to all of them because it seems like everything is everybody's here. So we missed you down here, uh, Andrew, and I will have some adult beverages in your honor with our friends and uh, maybe our foes, too. Maybe I'll be a, just a super nice guy. We'll see. Hey, never know, you know, never too late to turn over a new leaf and exercise concepts of forgiveness, unless, of course, you get beaten a nose, in which case all bets are off. But that's not going to happen this weekend. We wish you a lot of luck at the Breeders' Cup. I am going to be writing a lot of stuff on my website, andrewchampagne.com. It'll be more in-depth betting strategies, insights on each particular race. So you're not going to want to miss any of that. We're taping this on a Wednesday night. Fridays will be up on Thursday. Saturdays will be up on Friday. I'll also have some multi-race exotics dive-ins over on Odds Checker US, keeping myself really busy over here. But look, it's Breeders' Cup. These are the weeks that we live for as horse racing fans. You only need to be right a couple of times in order to make a lot of money. Dive in, get involved, and enjoy yourself with the Breeders' Cup World Championships. For J.D. Fox, I'm Andrew Champagne. Thanks very much for spending some time with us here on Champagne and J.D. Again, if you like what we do, go on down below, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button. But most importantly, J.D., send us home. Everybody be safe out there and stay off the beaches unless they're at Old Del Mar. Have a good one, everybody.